IVIG or SCIG? Is one better? Let's find out. So IVIG is one way, one method of infusing antibodies or immunoglobulins. Is it best for everyone? No. Is it better for some? Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna get into that today. And one of the major differences between both IVIG and SCIG or subcutaneous immunoglobulin, one is self-infused and the other is infused typically by a healthcare professional. One takes a lot longer to infuse. The other can be done at home in the comfort of your, your own abode and takes about one to two hours to infuse. So, you know, most people look at this and, and if they don't have a lot of experience with it, they're kind of like, well, why wouldn't I choose subcutaneous IVIG? It just seems, seems so much easier. You know, I can do it, I can infuse my home. I don't need to go to a hospital or an infusion clinic. And there's a lot of people that just wanna be hands off with their therapy. You know, they're, they're not feeling well. They both get the job done, as I said in the beginning. There's, one is not more effective than the other, but they each do come with their positives and negatives. So in the end, it's really, you know, just really up to you to decide what works best for you. So the first aspect we're going to talk about is frequency. So as I mentioned, IVIG is typically given once a month and sub-QIG can be given daily. It can be given a couple times a week. It can be given every two weeks. It can be given, there's a million possibilities. Um, IVIG is typically given over three to five days, whereas sub-QIG you give, as I just mentioned. Each of them do have a loading dose, and what that basically means is if it's your first ever lifetime dose, we're going to give you a, a larger dose in the beginning just to kind of kick off the, the race, and then going forward you'll have a maintenance dose, which is usually maybe a little little less don't worry about any of that don't worry about it don't worry about it and the third comparison that i'm going to make for scig and ivig are side effects or is side effects so with ivig because it's infused directly into your vein blood levels rise quicker um, you know, it's, it's a direct route into your systemic circulation. But with subcutaneous IVIG, you're infusing through the subcutaneous or fatty layer. And that's, again, usually in your belly, the backs of your arms, your hips, your thighs, anywhere you can kind of pinch an inch. Uh, but because it's infused through the fatty layer, it tends to to hit the system in a more gradual way, in a slower rate. Whereas IVIG hits your vein and it's off to the races and your body can, you know, develop side effects to this. Um, the major thing here and the major difference is IVIG tends to have more systemic side effects, meaning you'll have the chills, maybe the, the fever, the nausea, you know, if not during the infusion, directly after. Conversely though, the local skin type reactions, the local injection site area reactions are more frequent with subcutaneous IVIG just because of the nature of how it's infused. By virtue of the fluid sitting in their tissues, they can develop some swelling, which is expected because they have fluid sitting in that space just being absorbed gradually. Um, but they can also develop some skin itching or a little discomfort. There's, there's a million variables here, but with subcutaneous IVIG, you have few, more local reactions. IVIG, not so much. 
IVIG, higher systemic reactions, SCIG, not so much. Next, IVIG levels tend to be a little more erratic and people experience a wearing off. So IVIG lasts in the system for about 22 days or so. And then it's at that point that the levels start to drop off that we need to re-infuse. Subcutaneous IVIG levels kind of stay a little steadier in the system. So there isn't as much of a wearing off period as there is with IVIG. Both do the same thing, just get there in different ways. And if you're interested in, in finding out more about how doses are calculated and how many sites you might need, if you're interested in looking at more of that, I'm going to link uh, a site that I use very frequently called Coro. And it's basically a dosing calculator for subcutaneous IVIG. So to recap, there are several positives and negatives to both IVIG and subQIG. And you really just need to decide which one is, is best for you, your family, your lifestyle. Um, there's no saying that you can't switch back and forth between the two. You know, if you are a person that has horrible veins, then sub-QIG might be preferred for you because then, you know, you're not looking at a nurse coming in and sticking you a million times in order to get your therapy. It can be a daunting process if you have crappy veins and you have multiple sticks ahead of you. It, it can... It can really weigh on people. So I hope you got some great information out of this little comparison of IVIG and sub-QIG. I'd love to hear your comments. If you have specific questions as well, drop them down below. I'll do all my links to Koru and some of the IVIG and sub-QIG you know, sites uh, that you can check out. And I'm gonna see you in the next video, so click here. I'll see you there. We're talking about how exactly IVIG helps. How the heck it helps. What the heck does it do?